chronic kidney disease or chronic renal failure is a progressive, irreversible condition characterized by either a reduction in kidney function or kidney damage as a result of any cause that are present for more than three months. It is divided into stages based on the glomerular filtration rate, which is a measure of how well the kidneys are functioning. It shows the flow rate of filtrate through the glomerulus of the nephron into the Bowman's capsule and ultimately through the renal tubules. The stages are labelled 1 to 5, with two groups in stage 3. The definition of a reduced GFR is below 60 millilitres per minute, but in groups 1 and 2, the GFR may actually be above 60, but there is evidence of kidney damage. End stage renal disease is classed as a GFR below 15, or the need for renal replacement therapy, like dialysis or renal transplant. Kidney damage can be defined as signs of damage seen on imaging or on testing, such as a high albumin to creatinine ratio, which is a measurement of the amount of protein lost in the urine. In fact, in combination with GFR, these patients are divided into three further groups based on the albumin-creatinine ratio, with higher values indicating more damage and an increased likelihood of progression. Initially, chronic kidney disease may not cause many problems, and it is often asymptomatic. However, as it progresses, it brings with it several significant complications. These can include an elevated cardiovascular risk, where these patients are 5 to 10 times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than end-stage renal disease. The risk of stroke has been found to increase as the GFR lowers, by around 7% for every 10 milliliters per minute lost. This may also be the result of CKD contributing to hypertension, as well as being caused by it. This can be due to activation of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system and can also be because as the disease progresses, the kidney is less able to excrete sodium, leading to retention and subsequent fluid overload. Signs of fluid overload could be dyspnea due to pulmonary edema or effusion and peripheral edema or ascites. Anemia is also common, which contributes to dyspnea and can come from a reduction in erythropoietin from the kidney, which stimulates red blood cell development. It can also come from anemia of chronic disease due to a persistent inflammatory state and also a predisposition to iron deficiency. Patients can therefore experience symptoms of tiredness, lightheadedness and shortness of breath. CKD predisposes to a metabolic acidosis which can also contribute to anemia by reducing the lifespan of red blood cells. Acidosis happens because of increased bicarbonate excretion and a reduced ability to secrete acid. Linked to acidosis, there is a higher risk of hyperkalemia because at low GFR levels, there can be a difficulty in excreting potassium, therefore levels build up. Acidosis worsens this because hydrogen ions or acid are shifted into the cell in an attempt to reduce acidity, but in exchange for that, a potassium ion is shifted out, leading to hyperkalemia. There are consequences to the bones as well. The acidity can worsen osteoporosis, but also the kidney plays an important role in calcium and phosphate regulation because it produces 1-alpha hydroxylase, the enzyme that activates vitamin D. Ultimately, reduced kidney function means low levels of calcium and therefore higher parathyroid hormone levels, which can impact bone remodeling. The kidneys play a role in excreting urea, therefore as function drops, high urea levels are common, which can cause lethargy all the way up to encephalopathy. The most common cause for CKD is type 2 diabetes, which makes up between 30 and 50% of cases. Type 1 diabetes is less commonly the cause, 
at only 4%. The second most common cause is hypertension. Altogether, the causes can be divided into pre-renal, intrinsic, and post-renal. Pre-renal causes are those which cause a persistent reduction in renal perfusion pressure, like chronic heart failure or cirrhosis. This can also predispose to more intrinsic injury like acute tubular necrosis with multiple episodes over time leading to a progressively worsening renal function. Intrinsic causes can affect the renal vessels, including the glomerulus, such as nephrosclerosis, which is where the vessels become hardened, often as a result of diabetes and hypertension. There can be other conditions involving the glomerulus, largely divided into nephrotic or nephritic diseases. The first is characterised by large amounts of protein being released into the urine with little or no casts seen on microscopy. Examples include minimal change disease, focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, and diabetic nephropathy. Nephritic conditions, on the other hand, are characterised by a lower degree of proteinuria and the presence of red blood cell casts. Examples include post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, IgA nephropathy, or anti-GBM disease, also known as good pasture syndrome. Diseases that affect the renal tubules or interstitium are also intrinsic causes, such as polycystic kidney disease, sarcoidosis, and in some cases, nephrocalcinosis, where there is a deposition of calcium in the kidney, leading to damage. Chronic obstruction to the urinary flow may also lead to chronic kidney disease, including benign prostatic hyperplasia, extrinsic or intrinsic tumours, or even recurrent nephrolithiasis, better known as renal stones. In acute kidney injury, the damage to the kidney is usually short-term and is reversible, whereas in chronic kidney disease, the underlying cause is typically sustained, leading to progressive fibrosis, scarring, and therefore irreversible dysfunction of the renal structures. The general process is the renal insult leads to recruitment of extrinsic inflammatory cells, which also recruit and activate fibroblasts. These deposit extracellular matrix and disrupt the normal renal architecture. There is also a loss of native renal cells through necrosis and apoptosis, further disrupting the normal renal architecture. As the structure changes, the kidney becomes less able to carry out its normal functions. It is estimated that 10 to 14% of the population suffer from chronic kidney disease. Non-modifiable risk factors for the progression include older age, male gender, and non-Caucasian ethnicity, while modifiable risk factors include hyperglycemia, hypertension, proteinuria, obesity, and smoking. The progression is variable, however, has been found to typically be faster in patients with diabetic nephropathy or in patients with hereditary or acquired nephropathies. For a diagnosis, according to the Kidney Disease Outcomes Quality Initiative, patients should be tested three times over a three-month period, with at least two out of three results fitting a diagnosis of CKD. The estimated GFR from kidney function tests is a large part of the diagnosis and should be correlated with the clinical history and previous results to determine whether it is an AKI or CKD. Creatinine clearance is often used, however more accurate methods including cystatin C can also be options. Proteinuria should be assessed, typically an early morning sample of urine looking at the albumin to creatinine ratio. A urine dip can help identify microscopic hematuria and urinalysis, including microscopy, can identify urinary casts, which may point towards an intrinsic cause. Imaging also has a role. An ultrasound can show features that suggest CKD rather than AKI, such as smaller kidneys, 
increased echogenicity and reduced cortical thickness. It can also help to identify some structural causes, including cysts and hydronephrosis from obstructive causes. Ultrasound Doppler could be used to evaluate perfusion through the renal artery, and CT scans can be used to look at the structure as well, in particular looking for nephrolithiasis. The treatment is aimed at slowing down the progression of the disease and minimising complications, largely achieved by controlling risk factors like hyperglycemia and hypertension. Lifestyle modification includes cessation of smoking, low salt and low protein diets, and weight management, which together form the foundation of treatment. The first line medication includes ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, as they have been shown to slow down the progression and reduce the risk of cardiovascular events. They help to reduce the blood pressure and can reduce damage to the nephron by exerting a vasodilatory effect on the efferent arteriole, reducing intraglomerular pressure. In the AKI video, ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers were listed as a potential cause of AKI for this reason. More recently, SGLT2 inhibitors like dapagliflozin have been shown to improve mortality in CKD and are also considered first line, even in patients that already have good glycemic control. Metformin is normally also included in patients with poor glycemic control, but doses need to be adjusted in worse kidney function, it can exacerbate acidosis. There is often the initiation of lipid reducing medication, like statins, to help further reduce cardiovascular risk. In more particular cases, additional medications, like GLP-1 agonists for hyperglycemia, calcium channel blockers for hypertension, and antiplatelet medication to further reduce cardiovascular risk are used. Anemia may be treated with iron supplementation and erythropoietin. However, the target range is typically 90 to 120 mg per deciliter of hemoglobin, as pushing for higher values can actually reduce survival. Phosphate binders and calcium supplementation may be added to aid bone remodeling. Renal replacement therapy is where the function of the kidneys is replaced by other methods. Generally, it is the later stages that require this. However, it is not fixed on the GFR. The mnemonic AEIOU can help you remember some indications. Severe acidosis or electrolyte imbalances, intoxication including drugs, overload, and uremic symptoms. This could be extracorporeal dialysis, like hemodialysis or hemofiltration, where blood is taken out of the body and undergoes diffusion or filtration in another machine, before being returned to the body. Or it could be peritoneal dialysis, where dialysis fluid is placed into the peritoneal cavity and changed at intervals. Renal transplant is also considered to be a form of renal replacement therapy.